I'm going to go ahead and get started. And as I said, try to keep this a, a, a little bit shorter and um, quite frankly, have focused on really kind of recreating the experience that um, we just had in Egypt just last month, of which Steve was a part of that. Um, and you'll see him there just to the right of the camel that looks like he's about ready to come and give Steve a big old kiss on the cheek. Um, but this was this was the team in Egypt, and um, which is kind of what you expect to see in Egypt is us standing at the pyramid, uh, the pyramids, but here is perhaps a better view. This was a smaller team than what um, I usually take on the road. Um, and that was in, in, in many ways um, kind of planned intentionally because I just didn't know what to expect traveling in the post-pandemic era, particularly to Egypt. And um, so kept the team kind of small. As it turns out, it was not an issue at all. Um, we managed to navigate all the responsibilities, or I should say all the rules and regulations of, of showing up in Egypt during the pandemic, including you know, the rapid PCR test and all that kind of stuff, but had a wonderful team, which included from left to right in the green shirt there, um, um, Karen Copley from, um, West, uh, from uh, Westminster Spartanburg, now Next to her in the red shirt, Brady Clark from First Pres Amarilla, Steve Burgess, who's on this call um, from uh, West Hills, Omaha. Next to Steve is um, Jeff um, Clark, who's also from Westminster Spartanburg, and then here in the front in the and um, onto, onto my right side in the striped shirt is Rachel Seegers. This was her third trip to Egypt and um, also part of Spartanburg. And one of the kind of unique things that Outreach Foundation has offered as part of our Egypt initiatives um, is for congregations to, if they want to establish a sister church, a special relationship to help broker that as well. And so these dear folks from um, Spartanburg um, nurtured a relationship with a congregation in Egypt, um, or in Cairo rather, and so every time we return, they return there to, to meet, build relationships. And as I said, in traveling to Egypt, it's not a requirement to do that, but sometimes it's a way of, of helping relationships, international relationships relationships go deep in Egypt. One of the um, kind of essential parts of how Outreach Foundation works, as many of you know, is, is really working through the deep relationships we have on the ground with the church in those places. And so many of you may recognize the Reverend Dr. Tharwad Wakba, who um, is not only the professor of, of mission at the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo, but also as a pastor of the Synod of the Nile has been deeply engaged with leading their new church development movement. Um, and um, which is the part of our relationship with the Synod that Outreach Foundation has become deeply involved in, what many of your churches have been supporting. Um, and so Tharwad, we were so um, just so closely connected with Tharwat that Outreach actually brought him on as a, a part-time mission consultant for us. And so in addition to all those other hats, he also has works for us helps to put this itinerary together whenever we go to Egypt. But very important part of that team that makes sure that our trips are done well and done safely is this wonderful Presbyterian brother in Egypt whose name is Murad Setki. Um, Murad is a member of one of the Presbyterian churches there, but also is a professional um, Egyptian tour manager and has his own tour company. And so he does all of our, um, all of our relationships or all of our logistics on the ground. So we are truly in good hands when we make our way to Egypt. I mentioned that one of our key partners, or I, sh I should say one of our key partners in Egypt is the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo, or ETSC for short. This wonderful um, haven of equipping leaders, both for lay ministry within the church for pastoral ministry throughout the Middle East, and more recently, really equipping lay people 
to be more intentional in making Christ known in their places of business. And um, the ETSC has been established now for over 150 years. It's always a key component of when we go. Time is spent there at the seminary. Um, a little sidelight about the training of pastors. Not only does ETSC train pastors, but often those pastors will then be tapped by the synod to send them out of Egypt into mission positions. And um, one of the things I was able to do while I was there, in fact, before the team joined me in Egypt, was to meet with three Egyptian pastors who all happened to be in Egypt at the time, who are actually serving in Iraq. They're serving the churches in Iraq, our Presbyterian family in Iraq, that has not been able to train a lot of its own for ministry in Iraq. And so Egypt has su supplied pastors to serve the church in Iraq going on literally 30, 40 years. But these are recent um, missionaries sent from Egypt to serve the church in Iraq. Some are who you see going from left to right. Some are who's serving in Erbil. Bulos, who is newly sent to the city of Kirkuk. And then on the right there is um, Pastor Amgad, who is serving in um, Iraq. And uh, because Iraq is part of um, the Outreach Foundation focus, Steve Burgess has been there as well. Um, we interface with these Egyptians serving in Iraq, but also those who have been trained by the seminary and sent by the synod. Um, here you have our team gathered there on the seminary, uh, the seminary entryway um, surrounding um, the new president of the seminary, whose name is Hani Hanna. Um, along with some of the staff, which I'll kind of break down a little bit, some of those some of those wonderful conversations that we had. Darren Kennedy, some of you may know Darren. Darren is a longtime PCUSA mission co-worker who has taught at the seminary for most of his life. He's now the dean of the academic dean. And so he was responsible for having, for bringing together some of the faculty to be in conversation with us while we were there to kind of bring us up to date of what God's doing through through the seminary. Obviously, it was a wonderful chance for many of us to get to know better um, the Reverend Dr. Hani Hanna, who has been on the staff of the seminary um, for most of his life, but now stepped into the role of president after about 20 years of service by Dr. Atif Gendi, who once again, many of you may know, Atif is still on the staff of the seminary teaching. He's a New Testament scholar but also running the Center for Middle East Christianity at the seminary. Um, some of the new faculty, you know, one of the things that ETSC has put a lot of energy into is in training up its own men and women to teach. Um, you know, before, you know, for many years ago, the seminary relied principally on um, international scholars coming to teach. Now, there are very few internationals who are teaching at the seminary, but more than not, they are Egyptians themselves who are now getting the kinds of academic credentials that are needed. And one of those new appointees to the seminary is this dynamic young man whose name is um, um, Joseph Lewis. And Joseph, I knew first as a student at the seminary, he then graduated, went on to serve in a place of ministry for five years, now has recently brought back as an uh, associate or an assistant pastor um, to teach pastoral care. Um, and counseling. And he will then go off at some point to get his advanced degrees, but it's kind of one of the ways that the seminary is very intentional about training up its own to lead the seminary. Our time at the seminary is always very vibrant with faculty like Reverend John, who you see on the right of your screen. Um, one of the new students there, this young woman who is studying worship um, and, and leading worship and music has this beautiful voice. And then her brother who happened to be visiting, I would have to expect her brother to follow her um, to the seminary at some point, but it just kind of gives you a little bit of an insight into this warm, welcoming environment. Um, we always share a meal together with faculty and staff and um, students, which is also a wonderful way um, to enter a little bit more deeply into their lives. One of the key components of um, of really spiritual life at the seminary is the chapel. 
um, which under normal circumstances meets on a regular basis. Right now, the seminary has not yet brought the students back to the seminary. That will happen this month, but they still did the sem they did their chapel service every Thursday and then broadcast that um, over the internet because they have a, a pretty vibrant connection to their students and to the, the Presbyterian community there um, via the internet. And I had the privilege of bringing the message in, um, that in that chapel, that Thursday chapel that we were there. And the reason why I share this story is because I used it as a chance to bring a brief message talking about finding heroes who model for us perseverance, and particularly in the sense the way that Paul uses that term of perseverance, of not just longevity and kind of sticking with it, but the idea of faith that is lived out over difficult circumstances and how we learn from those heroes of faith. And I referenced one of the experiences that our team had just had a few days before as we traveled south from Cairo down to the area of Minya, about four hours south of Cairo, to see a church, a new church development in a little village that seems kind of one of you might say one of those villages that time forgot. Um, and yet God had not forgotten this village. And so as we pulled up into this village, literally the village was there to greet us. Um, as we got off the bus, you know, began to meet the men and the women, we didn't really know the story of the church in this place, but we would soon learn what God had done here through the vision of pastors and lay leaders from the area. Brady Clark, one of our team members, meet here or shown here with Reverend Manasseh Sadek who is the pastor of one of the large Presbyterian churches in El Tayyiba which is a city maybe about, I want to say it's about 40 kilometers from here, El Taiba. Um, there must be something in the water in El Taiba because there is not one but two Presbyterian churches in this small village. But this, the presence of the Presbyterians in this place has been kind of a remarkable, um, kind of a remarkable example of about how God sometimes chooses the most unlikely locations to grow his church because El Taiba has some of the largest and most vital Presbyterian churches in the Senate and they're in this little village. Um, Reverend Manasseh who presides, who is the pastor over what we might call the first Presbyterian church in El Taiba has over 600 people in worship every Sunday. And so as kind of the nearest big Presbyterian church, he also has some responsibility for overseeing the ministry in this little village. So he began, we sat outside, we began to, he introduced us to a remarkable family that included six brothers, five of which are still alive. You see one of the brothers, another brother here, and a sister who had a vision to see a church planted here. And so they gave the Presbyterians a piece of land and said, build a church here and we will be the supporters for this. We will be the initial families that help to grow this church. Well, after we had kind of met them and had gotten kind of taken away, kind of taken up by their vision and their commitment to see a church planted in their village, I asked the obvious question is you, you brothers and sister, people of faith, you must have come from a very faithful mother and father. Tell me about them. Well, they proceeded to point in the other direction, just a few, maybe about 30 feet away, sitting on the stoop of a little nursery school they run, was a remarkable woman um, whose name was Um Salah, who is the mother of this family. And so we began to learn about the vision of this family, their commitment to see the church planted in their village, this little church that was planted there has had an enormous history of struggle um, to find legitimacy in the eyes of the government and um, told some incredible stories about how the government at one point um, had closed the church. So they began to worship in the in the courtyard. They just you know met out on the lawn adjacent to the church. At one point, the church told them they needed to shut their doors. And so they took the doors off 
of the church so the doors could not be shut. The man that you see here standing in front of those said doors, his name is Ahmad, is a lay pastor trained by the synod, uh, excuse me, trained by the seminary in, in their lay ministry training program. He has served this church faithfully for years, travels here five days a week to help lead and guide this church. And it's just one example of the kind of ministries that are planted sometimes in the most remarkable way. Um, the church recently opened a nursery school because there's very few opportunities for education in the village. They opened a small nursery school, um, hired a couple of the church members as teachers, and as I said, was just an inspiration about what God is doing, sometimes in surprising ways. A little bit more I'll tell you about new church development, but a little side conversation traveling to a place like Egypt. Obviously, you can't you cannot ignore the incredible history and um, um, the artifacts of this place. And so we always make sure, of course, that we touch on, um, you know, some of the great monuments of Egyptian history, like the Great Pyramids of Giza. Um, the Sphinx, as you see here in front of it's also an opportunity as Kimmy knows very well um, to make your first or perhaps only camel ride as Rachel is about ready to do here. Um, it's also a good chance to channel your inner um, Lawrence of Arabia as I love to do when I'm there as well. Um, the Egyptian Museum is also one of the landmark visits that we have to make there that until very recently has housed some of the most important antiquities from Egypt. And I said, I like the, uh, the treasures from the tomb of King Tut. But one of the things, one of the transitions happening in Egypt, and some of you may be aware of this, is that a number of years ago, the Japanese government um, helped began construction of a new state-of-the-art museum at, in um, Cairo to, to move these treasures from this really old kind of archaic museum, although very historic, to this new state-of-the-art museum. So when we were there, a lot of the displays were actually closed or literally, you know, the the, the, um, the packing was around some of the artifacts and perhaps by the next time we go there, that new state-of-the-art museum will be open. Um, one of the other things that we, we try to do if we can make time for it in our PAC schedule is to literally visit with the Synod leadership. This is the offices of the Synod of the Nile. Um, which oversees the 450 congregations that make up the Presbyterian Church in Egypt. So we spent a, a wonderful um, day there with synod leadership, including the General Secretary, Rafat, um, Rafat Fathi, who you see here with many of the pastors who lead one of the 13 councils of the, of the um, Synod of the Nile, like Reverend Amir, seen here with Steve, who is responsible for what they call the social service um, committee, which works with churches, particularly to help them establish ministries um, like clinics in their, in their towns or preschools, nurseries, and those kinds of things, help set up program for micro lending programs to help alleviate poverty. Um, two of the uh, wonderful leaders of the Synod um, to meet again, Tharwat Wakba, who I mentioned before, but when Tharwat, for eight years, Tharwat headed up the committee, the council of the synod that oversees both mission as well as church planting, what's called the Pastoral Outreach and Mission Committee, the POMC. He finally retired from that or had to step down after two consecutive four-year terms that became not eight years, but nine because of the pandemic, and passed that leadership over to Reverend Samuel Adel, um, who we had a chance to meet and spend time with, and this new church development initiative is in superb hands. We visited 10 congregations, by the way, when we were there. That's a lot of churches to visit in a short period of time, as um, my team will let you know, but they literally stepped up to the plate um, for some long days, but very rich ones. And so kind of contrasting that small village church that you just saw, by the way, in El Dabiki, down by Minya, 
to visit one of the large churches that is also a relative new church plant, but not out in the villages, but literally in one of the suburbs of Cairo, what is called 10th of Ramadan. The name of the suburb is 10th Ramadan. It's a whole city, a satellite city that the Egyptian government for many, many years has been creating satellite cities around large urban areas like Cairo, Alexandria, Luxor to help alleviate overcrowding in this densely populated country. So 10th of Ramadan city um, has a large Presbyterian church that was planted, begun, the fellowship began back in the, the 1990s. And this large congregation has a vital ministry. We were met when we arrived there by um, the elders and the leaders of the church in the blue there is, is Karen Copley, one of our um, uh, the team on this last trip, and they spent the, the many hours with us telling us about the ministries of the church, but also their own vision for planting another church in 10th Ramadan. They took us to a piece of land that they were given by the government to plant a new church, and they're hoping to begin construction of that. But we, while we were there together, we um, led uh, just kind of a blessing prayer for that. I had everybody scoop up dirt in their hand, kind of lift that up to the heavens, commit that from, um, from common to sacred use to see God's God's kingdom built further and further. And you can see kind of that new construction of one of those satellite cities growing up around that. Back at the congregation, back at the home church of 10th Ramadan, because it was Friday, this is the day where most Sunday schools meet because Sunday, because Friday is like Saturday for the rest of us. So the kids are out of school. This is when the vibrant Sunday school projects, uh, uh, programs meet. There is, as you can see, these are the little ones meeting there at the church. They also have a huge, what we would call middle school, high school ministry. These were only the girls because the boys, another same group, same number of people, the boys were meeting in another part of the, the building because the, the lesson today um, was about kind of growing into mature adulthood and what that means in terms of what happens to your body, you know, making safe boundaries and, you know, all those kind of difficult, kind of uncomfortable conversations conversations that everybody has to have with young people, this was happening and being led by the church there. Um, one of the pastors who has been brought to the church, whose name goes by the name Misha, his nickname Misha Nagi, um, has been brought in specifically to be the pastor at this new church that is developing. And so this bright young, literally just out of seminary, um, is going to lead the initiative in planting a church from a church that was itself a plant. This is part of the, the dynamics of the, the church in Egypt today. I um, want to say a word about opportunities for the future. Um, it has been the habit of, and kind of the, the regular rhythm, we might say, of Outreach Foundation over the past five, six years. Um, I lead most of these trips to Egypt, and usually November, I found, is a really good time to do that. The weather is beautiful, and just have kind of put that into the rhythm of my schedule. Um, and But we did a trip in February, as I said, more of kind of a test. Get, you know, after COVID, let's get ourselves out there, see what it's like. But we, because this, this the trip went so smoothly in February, we can see the COVID restrictions lifting, making travel a little bit easier, decided to go ahead and um, calendar another trip for November. So you're some of the first to hear about this. This will be up on our website, hopefully even by the end of today, um, for a November trip that will be 1 to 12 of November. One of the things in, in putting together these trips to Egypt, there's usually two parts of it. One is about half of the trip spent in Cairo and its environs. And then the other half of the trip, we travel to another part of Egypt to see what the church is doing in that place. Well, I'm very excited that in November of this year, Lord willing, we will travel all the way down to the south of Egypt. Outreach Foundation has not yet been there. I've been there, but Outreach has not yet been there. But the Synod of the Nile says this is where we would like you to go next, down to Aswan, way in the south, in the kind of the former Nubian kingdoms, we might say, 
this beautiful part of Egypt of which one of the great um, historic UNESCO landmarks is the temples at Abu Simbel, which were these magnificent rock cut temples. Um, there were two of them built by carved under the reign of Ramesses the Great one celebrating himself in four colossal statues and then another one just kind of down the down the way we might say for his beautiful wife Nefertari. Um, some of you may know a little bit about the, the history of these temples that during the building of the Aswan High Dam as the waters were rising for the artificial lake, what became Lake Nasser from the backup of these waters from the, from the um, Aswan High Dam, these, this UNESCO world treasure literally had to be cut in pieces and moved to higher ground. And that's what you see here. So I'm very excited that this is going to be one of the highlights when we travel down to Aswan to the Presbytery, one of the southernmost Presbyteries of the Synod that we will spend about five, four and a half days down here as well visiting churches, but also not failing to visit one of the great um, UNESCO landmarks, which is um, World Heritage Site. But at the end of the day where the rubber meets the road is our ability to meet and know our family of faith in that place as um, a, a Jeff Randall, one of our travelers, has done here with one of the, the little scooter lees that we met at yet another one of the churches that we visited. And so that, as I said, kind of a little bit of an insight into what it's like to travel with the Outreach Foundation would we'll invite you to, as I said, we hope by the end of this day we will have um, the, um, the specifics, a trip flyer up on the website for that November trip and would love for as many of you that feel called to that. We don't have a limit on that. Um, Egypt is pretty used to taking a lot of people in as travelers and because of our wonderful connections and family there, we're able to take, you know, um, whatever size group we decide. So I'm gonna stop there and allow for, um, Kelly, maybe to just open up the mic, because we don't have too many people here that it would be distracting. Um, and Kelly, I think, has gotten a few questions to share. And I'm delighted now that I see everybody's face that Jason sent us um, is on the call. He waves to us there. Jason is a pastor in North Carolina. We had a really good Zoom call yesterday, I think it was, or the day before. Um, Jason is looking to get gather some um, some people from his presbytery, he's an eco-pastor from the Presbytery of, South, of North Carolina and travel with us to Egypt in November. And so he would be glad to invite others to join him. Wouldn't you, Jason? I would, yes, Marilyn. So I don't know if my mic's on, but- You are, we're yeah. hearing you loud and clear. In fact, uh, can, you, uh, can you unmute everybody, Kelly, at this point in time? Because we're not too many of us. And I see my dear friend, Julie Burgess, who is the other part of the Steve Burgess that some of you met earlier. Julie has not yet been to Egypt, but she has been three, 400 times on the road, it seems, with me to places like Iraq and Syria and Lebanon. I, Marilyn, well, while you were introducing that November trip, I was texting Steve because I could see the wheels turning in his head. And I said, Steve, would you rather go to Egypt in November and let me go to Syria in October? Because that would make, it would still be four trips total for us this year, but it would split us up and give him, I mean, I could, you know, I know my husband and I could see his eyes get this big when you just showed that site. So since you still haven't taken us to Palmyra, I know I haven't taken you to there Palmyra. You That's coming. So, hey, you know what? If we had both Steve and Jason, who's on this call, we'd have two really tall guys, which I always love to have in groups because then it's easier to spot my team because um, I can look to the, the, the tall heads. So, and that's not the only reason, by the way, that I like both Jason and Steve on this, but there's some practical consideration. Okay. Kelly, are, are there any questions to that would be good to share with me? Okay, um, I didn't see much come up in the chat, but um, 
I mean, I think a good question to ask for any of these things is, um, you know, for somebody who hasn't gone on an outreach trip before, but is interested, what can they expect to take away from the experience from going on a trip with you? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I could almost put that to Julie, um, who could probably speak to that from, from firsthand. And actually, you know, I don't think anybody on this call has ever not been on a trip, except with Jason. But I think he's already kind of gotten a feel from it. You know, I mean, in essence, you know, it's a good, serious question. You know, as with all things with the Outreach Foundation, you know, what we aim for, you know, on the, you know, the simple, you know, summary of that is to connect God's people with God's work in the world. But it's, you know, it's to celebrate what the church is doing around the world. Outreach exists to help kind of bring people kind of behind that movement of the spirit in whatever manifestation it takes in those places. But at the same time to recognize all, everything that we have to learn from the church, you know, in sometimes in difficult places and challenging places, um, you know, had a, a conversation with a, a young woman from um, one of our other partner churches, First Pres Winston Salem, right before this call. Um, she's a new member of the staff there, and talking about how you know one of the one of the things that we often talk about with the you know, the fact that we come alongside new church development in Egypt is that you know planting the church and kind of multiplying the church is one of the things, you know, we as North American Christians, um, you know, kind of yearn for and know that this is what God calls us to, to, to expand the work of the church, not to just be content with, you know, what's happening inside our doors. And yet we're not very good at that. And we don't often succeed in church planting initiatives in the United States. And so, you know, from the very beginning, we've said to churches who, you know, have a heart for, for church planting is if you want to see how that is being done and where God is blessing it, come meet the church in Egypt, where, you know, literally of those 450 congregations that make up the Presbyterian church in Egypt, 25% of them were planted in the last last 10 years, 25% of those churches in the past 10 years, you know, this is a movement with vitality that God has blessed. And so, you know, the questions, you know, to be asking the things to be looking for is, is what, what's the Holy Spirit doing here um, that we might be able to learn from, you know, so, you know, as I said, developing, you know, sometimes a sister church relationship is a good way to do it but it's not a necessary thing. I think just experiencing the vitality of the church in Egypt in general, um, we come back hopefully with a new vision for what God calls our congregations in various parts of, of the country um, to be and to do, and maybe to be a little bit braver because we see how brave and courageous the church in, in sometimes hard places is. Like, and, you know, as I said, you know, the, it just makes me laugh when I think about this little congregation <laughs> El Dabiki, who was told to close the doors of the church. And so they kind of called the bluff of the government. They just took the doors off. Can't close them. No doors there. I mean, if we would just think of these things anyway, but it's a, a great question. So I know, so Kimmy, I'll put Kimmy on the spot. So Kimmy was um, was a pastor here at, at, here in Atlanta. I'm in Savannah. A pastor in, in um, Claremont Prez and her church developed a relationship there in Egypt. She's now moved out to Montana. Are you kind of thinking to maybe kind of bring that congregation along with us to Egypt at some point, honey? I think she's frozen. Oh, yes, that is the hope for us. Um, am I on? Yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm unstable. Uh, can you hear me? There we go. Um, uh, yeah, so the hope is here to bring um, our congregation here, um, possibly even our presbytery. We're a relatively small um, church um, in comparison. Um, Apparently things change when you move to Montana um, in terms of church size. Um, yeah. We're the third largest in our presbytery. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, um, but yeah, sort of thinking about what this looks like for us as a congregation yeah. um, and yeah. for maybe this presbytery um, of exploring. Um, uh, yeah, the, and it, it is for us, it's yeah. that question, that revitalization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do we do this well and be faithful? Yeah. Uh, 
in this time. I know, place. and I can't help but think because I'm guessing that your presbytery is probably geographically spread over quite a big distance. Um, it being Montana and all, and you know what you've just described of that, along with you know the smaller churches, is exactly the situation of the Presbyterian Aswan. You know, this is one of the biggest geographical presbyteries because it's far from you know kind of the epicenters of the church, and yet it covers vast territory with small churches that are very vital. I mean, it's in some ways it's exact parallel. So maybe that's what God has in store. So. I dare hope that. And then I think I'm stand on camels. So, and Kimmy does stand on camels, which we don't recommend. But <laughs> we can't can't seem to stop her when she's on the camel. She's kind of hard to reach. But um, anyway, you know, I you know, I just I mean, Steve, talk a little bit just about the comfort of traveling in Egypt and where we stayed and how we moved about since you just did that freshly. Well, first I would um, say that the baba ganoush is excellent which one is my, an eggplant dip by the way just truly one of my favorite things to eat anytime anywhere but anyway but no we stayed in a fantastic hotel just next to the airport um and so we were able to to kind of i don't know um meet some different people that way of course in addition to our traveling um, and the staff was amazing. I mean, after, you know, a day or two, they're, they're treating you like, um, like you're their neighbor and you guys have lived, you know, on the same street for yeah. years and years and years. They've just become that familiar with you and that, you know, friendly. It's just impressive. And of course, then um, anywhere you go, I mean, the Egyptian people are, are lovely and um, so, um, welcoming and glad to see you and um it's just it was you know it was just like coming home did you um, get enough to eat while you were there steve <laughs> um just barely just barely i mean you know five meals a day is, is yeah. <laughs> um a little less than what i'm accustomed to but i you know I, and of course, I'm making jokes for those of you who travel to the Middle East, um, you know, that their hospitality is like excessive. You know, in fact, I've, I often have made the joke to people when they will, you know, they know the places I go and they'll, they'll kind of lean in and kind of half whisper, um, is it dangerous? And I'll go, let's, let's speak, let's look at it this way. I'm more likely to uh, suffer death by hospitality than I am for any other reason, because it is. Yeah, it's constant and it is overwhelming. But um, yeah. anyway, it is it's a sweet space. It's a you know, the, I travel to a lot of different places. And I just would describe the people of Egypt there. It's they're a sweet people. They're a sweet people. Yeah. And certainly for the church um, there, you know, the church loves us. We're part of the family in that place. We're so grateful for the long relationships. Um, that we have so that when we show up anywhere, even if the church has never met any of us, there is this kind of immediate bonding of, of the family of faith because that's what we are. So um, anyway, a great encouragement to all of you to consider. Um, as I said, this is the first time that outreach has been as outreach to down to, to Aswan, which I'm very excited about. We fly there, by the way. So that's all costed into the ground cost. And as I said, the flyer for that um, should be up on our website. I'm thinking probably by the end of day, because I just sent that all off to our very capable communications staff, of which um, Kelly is an integral part of that. So um, friends, I really want to be sensitive to the time and um, alert you to the fact that we're hoping to continue this on a monthly basis. The third Thursday trek that we have scheduled for next month um, is Pakistan. And my colleague, Tom Boone, who right now is in Liverpool, then we'll continue on to Poland to meet with refugees there and end his epic journey in Pakistan. We'll be leading the third Thursday trek um, a month from now and would we'll invite you to be part of that. If we decide to change that um, to something else because of what has transpired um, as he's on the road along with our executive director, we'll do that. But I hope it will be a, 
a meaningful time to, as I said, get some real updates of what God's doing, how outreach is part of that, and how we'd love for you to join us. And we, all of these will be recorded. Um, Kelly will edit these. These will go up on our website. So if there's other people from your church, you know, for instance, with Kimmy, Jason, I know wants to share this with pastors and other mission leaders from his presbytery. Um, it's a great way to, to, you know, once this is up, go find the link for that and say, hmm, go see what it looked like um, to just do this and get it personal. So we get all those resources up. So, so friends, I'm going to go ahead and end there. You all know how to get a hold of me through the Outreach Foundation or Marilyn Borst at AOL the easiest way, as opposed to Marilyn at theoutreachfoundation.org, the longest email address in the history of email addresses, but Marilyn Boris at AOL.com, you can always find me or through the outreach. So anyway, um, dear Kelly, thank you for being part of this, for facilitating it, for all of you to be part of this. Tell your friends, going to get this set up on a regular basis, and let me go ahead and close us with prayer. Father, we thank you for the faithful witness of your church in Egypt. And we can't help but pray for the church to know that your church in Ukraine and in the surrounding countries are doing everything they can to be brave, to be salt and light, to, sign, to shine the love of Christ in caring ways um, in this difficult circumstance. We ask for your presence there in those hard places. We know you are there. And to the extent that we can be part of praying for a resolution of peace, for our resources to be a caring hands of the church in those places, we ask you to guide us. And we thank you again for the faithful witness of your church in so many places who give witness and energy to the reality that one, knee, every, one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. It's in his matchless name that we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Thanks for being here.